This is a reading of the Gnostic Fragments, written by Nimrod de Rosario, read by D.J. Morgan, published by Hyperborean Publishing Company. Beginning of Prologue Eighty-nine fragments from the novel The Mystery of Belucena Vilca and 45 fragments from Fundamentals of the Hyperborean Wisdom have been selected to be read and studied by aspirants. These 134 fragments are an optimum synthesis of the gnosis that Nimrod de Rosario had the mission to bring to this world. These fragments are also an introduction to Nimrod de Rosario's books. Once the aspirants read and reread them, they could continue with the novel and with the first volumes of the fundamentals. The study of Nimrod de Rosario's texts must be carried out thoroughly, taking into account that every word and every phrase is extremely important. Nimrod de Rosario taught us that by reading and rereading his writings, the awakening and the transmutation of aspirants will take place. Fragments from the Mystery of Belichena Vilca. 1. If you are already aware of the great deceit, then read the following lines carefully, because you will find here some clues to be followed along the returning path to origin. 2. The secret, in sum, lies in knowing the extraterrestrial origin of the human spirit and acquiring enough wisdom to return to that origin finally leaving forever the insane universe of matter and energy, the insane universe of the created forms. 3. Men coming from a total and frightful war, from an essential war that had began long before in the extraterrestrial origin of human spirit, and that have not ended yet. Four. The essential war is a clash among gods, a conflict that started in heaven and spread to earth, involving men in the process. 5. The ultimate wisdom would coincide with the strongest will of returning to the origin, with the major orientation towards the origin, with the highest courage determined to fight against the powers of matter, and with the maximum spiritual hostility towards the non-spiritual. 6. Before the fall of the extraterrestrial spirit into the matter, there is an extremely primitive man-animal on earth, son of God the creator of all material forms. Such man-animal had an animic essence, that is to say, a soul that could reach immortality but lacked eternal spirit. 7. After performing the mystery of the fall, the spirit ended up inside the man-animal as a prisoner of the matter and that is how the need for his liberation emerged. 8. To understand the sign of the origin, it was needed exactly 13 plus 3 Vrunas, namely, an alphabet of 16 signs called Vrunas or Varunas, also known as the Runes. 9. The highest priestly holiness, the one that was expressed by the control of the soul, conceived either as a body or as a force, also meant the most abject submission to the powers of matter. 10. In the origin, beyond the stars, there was an uncreated light that could only be seen by the spirit. That infinite light was imperceptible to the soul. However, though invisible in front of that infinite light, the soul felt as in front of the most impenetrable blackness, an infinite abysm, and it was left immersed into an uncontrollable fear. This happened because the uncreated light of the spirit made the soul feel the intuition of the eternal death, end of its existence as much as of any other created thing. After a, quote, Mahaman Vrntara, unquote, a super great year of creator God's manifestation. 11. It dealt with three concepts, the principle of occupation, the principle of enclosure, and the principle of the wall. 12. 
The wisdom would free the spirit in the origin and would make it more powerful than the creator god. In this, But in this world, where the spirit is chained to the man-animal, the creator god's cult would dominate the wisdom. Everything that exists in this world is just a gross imitation of the things that exist in the true world. Just... That was the end of fragment 13. 14. Just as the alchemist stirs lead, so would the members of the chosen family tirelessly go through the tests put by their ancestors, until some day, one of them, by turning one thousand times round a circle under other heavens, manages to fulfill the family mission, thus purifying his astral blood. A transmutation would therefore take place that would make it possible for him to reverse the involution of the Kali Yuga or the Dark Age, to return to the origin and to acquire the wisdom again. The Great Chief 15. The Great Chief of the Hyperborean Spirits, Lucifer, quote, the one who defies the power of the Creator God's illusion with the power of wisdom, unquote, the messenger of the unknowable God, the true Christos of the uncreated light. Sixteen. They kept the sacred alphabet of thirteen plus three vrunas, which were represented by sixteen signs, composed of straight lines, and to which they associated a sound of their common use language. Thus, thirteen consonants and three vowels were available. Seventeen. Its fire would be placed in the man's heart, and it would transmute him, and this fire, at first extremely warm, would finally become colder than ice, and such cold fire would produce human nature's mutation. 18. The infinite blackness offered by goddess Parina's caliber death, in which all created light hopelessly turns off, can reflect that something that is the uncreated spirit, and the reflection of the spirit in the infinite blackness of caliber death is the naked truth of oneself. Before the infinite blackness, the created life dies of fear and the spirit finds itself. That is why, if the chosen one after the reunion gets life back, he will be the bearer of a sign of death that will leave his heart forever frozen. The soul will not be able to avoid being subjugated by the stone seed of oneself that grows and develops at its expense and transmutes the chosen one into a hyperborean initiate a man of stone, a wise warrior. As a man of stone, the resurrected chosen one will have a heart of ice and will exhibit an absolute courage. He will be able to unreservedly love the woman of flesh, but she will no longer be able to turn on the hot fire of the animal passion in his heart. So in the woman of flesh he will search for the one who possesses like goddess Parina, both a soul and an uncreated spirit, and who is capable of revealing in her infinite blackness, the naked truth of oneself. He will love her, the Caliber Woman, with the cold fire of the Hyperborean race, and the Caliber Woman will answer with the frozen amort of Perina's Caliber death. 19. The contemplation of oneself, which is a reflection of the Eternal Spirit, is experienced in a unique instant that cannot be seized by the time of creation. The chosen ones that reach Pyrena's caliber death will never be able to answer that question. The experience of eternity is indescribable. 20. A man of stone, the one who has come back from death, he who in death was loved with Pyrena's caliber cold fire, and now keeps memory of Amort, he who has felt, beyond the love of life, the Amort of caliber death, that is to say, the no-death of caliber death, and now has been immortalized as the son of death. 21. The man of stone shall only act. He shall listen in silence to the voice of a cold fire and shall act, and his act will express the ultimate spiritual courage. Whatever he does, his act will be founded upon the absolute basis of oneself, beyond good and evil and no judgment or punishment coming from the world of deceit will affect him. Neither will any variation of the great deceit, 
Not even the hot fire of animal passion could drag him back to the dream of life. Wise and brave as a god, the man of stone will fight only if necessary, and will wait quietly for the final battle. He will long for the origin, and will be moved by the nostalgia for the immort of the goddess. He will look for his original partner in the caliber woman, and, if he finds her, he will love her with the cold fire of oneself, and she will embrace him with the uncreated light of her eternal spirit, which will be infinite blackness for the created soul. 22. On Earth, the spirit had been chained to the man-animal so that its willpower accelerated the evolution of his psychic structure. This enchainment was so strong, and so deep was the spirit submerged in the anemic nature of the man-animal that, forgetting all about its origin, it believed it was a product of nature and of the powers of the matter, that is, a creation of the gods. 23. Navutan comes to free the spirit of man from his prison in the world of the creator god. The spirit is uncreated, namely, it has not been created by the creator god and therefore nothing that takes place here can essentially denigrate the spirit, and most certainly nothing can ethically affect the spirit. The spirit is innocent and pure in the eternity of the origin. Hence, Navatan asserts that the Hyperborean spirit, belonging as it does to a race of warriors, can only manifest an attitude of essential hostility towards the world of the Creator God, can only rebel against the material order, can only doubt about the reality of the world that the great deceit constitutes, can only reject as false or as an enemy everything that is not the product of itself, that is, of the spirit. It can only pursuit with wisdom just one unique purpose, leaving the world of the Creator God where it is a slave, and returning to the unknowable world where it will be a God once again. On the other hand, Jesus Christ comes to save the soul of man from sin, from the offense against the Creator God's law, the soul is created by the Creator God, and it must blindly obey its Father's law. 24. Hence, Jesus Christ asserts that the man's soul, the Creator God's most perfect creature, must only manifest an attitude of essential love towards the world of the Creator God. It must only accept its place within the material order with resignation. It must only believe in the reality of this world. It must only accept as true and friendly what has been proven to come in the name of the Creator God, and it must pursue just one unique purpose with wisdom, to remain in the world of the Creator God as a sheep gazed by Jesus Christ or by the priests that represent Him. To be a God or a sheep, that is the question. 25. Like Gnostics and Manichaeans before, like Cathars and Albigensians later on, they will only accept part of the Gospels, particularly John's, and they will utterly reject the Old Testament. That is what they argued. The Jewish God was none other than Jehovah Satan, an aspect or face of the one God creator of the material universe. The account of the creation of the material universe is narrated in the Genesis where the uncreated and eternal spirit would be enslaved. The created universe is, therefore, intrinsically malignant for the uncreated spirit. The spirit only gives value to the true world where it comes from. 26. Another one is the Church of Christos, or just the Church, to which the Lords of Tarsus and the Circulus Domini Canis belonged long before, and to which many of those who are for the spirit and against the powers of matter for Christos light and against Jehovah Satan belong. One is the church of treason against the spirit of man, and the other is the church of liberation of the spirit of man. One is the church of the demon of the immortal soul, and the other is the church of the God of the eternal spirit. 27. The thirteen plus three runic signs of the sacred alphabet were carved on the Irminsal column where the stone of Venus was embedded in its center, in remembran remembrance of Wotan's unique eye that looked at the world of the great deceit from the tree of terror. 28. 
The spirit is essentially a warrior. Consequently, the noble and warrior castes are spiritually superior to priestly castes. 29. What Cathars were actually acquainted with was the Hyperborean wisdom, which they taught by means of symbols taken from Mazdaism, Zervanism, Gnosticism, Judeo-Christianism, etc. So, they preached that good was of an absolute spiritual nature, and was completely out of this world. The spirit was eternal and uncreated, and it came from the origin of God, or good. On the contrary, evil was by nature all that was material and created. The world of matter, where the man-animal inhabits, was intrinsically malicious. The world had been created by Jehovah Satan, a, demoni a demonical demiurge. Therefore, they rejected the Bible as the word of Satan, and they particularly repudiated the Genesis where the creation of the world by the demon was narrated. The Roman church that accepted the Bible was then, quote, the synagogue of Satan, unquote, the dwelling of the demon. The man-animal created by Satan had two natures, the material body and the soul. The uncreated spirit had been attached to both of them, and since then remained prisoner of the matter. The spirit, incapable of liberating itself, dwelled in the soul, and the soul gave life to the material body that was immersed in the evil of the material world. The spirit thus found itself sunk in hell, condemned to the pain and suffering imposed to the man-animal by Jehovah Satan. 30. It was the time for the spiritual awakening and the material renouncement. It was the time for clearly distinguishing between the whole of the spirit and the nothingness of the matter. 31. Profoundly spiritual men would be needed, men who had the Hyperborean wisdom and were transmuted due to the memory of the origin, the revelation of the naked truth of oneself. More precisely, men of stone would be needed. 32. To oppose the Hyperborean wisdom against the one God cult. 33. In every Hyperborean initiate, the spirit had to dominate the soul. 34. The man will lose his virility and will become softer. He will be like a woman, even when he can procreate. His determination to fight will be weakened by a growing effeminacy that will spread to all mankind. Perplexed, many people will mistake sodomite moral for a product of high civilization. But will actually happen, what will actually happen is that the heart will control the mind and will weaken the will. At the end, everybody will end up accepting the synarchic way of life, and the man will replace the eagle with the dove, war with peace, and the heroic risk with the passive comfort. 35. Time is the constant flow of the one's consciousness. Between the beginning and the end of time is creation, and at the end of time is the perfection of the soul as stone of fire. It is... Yod Hevahe's will that the soul reaches the final perfection according to Metatron's model. But now the soul cannot see the cold stone that lies deep inside itself. The soul cannot perceive it until it gets in the way and becomes a stumbling stone for the soul, an insurmountable obstacle to reach the good of the final perfection. Without the seed of stone in the mud man's soul, there would have been neither evil nor hate against creation. The evolution would have taken place by the force of love for the Creator. The final perfection would have been ensured for all created soul. Now it will be impossible for the Yerevahe's plan to be fulfilled. 36. He had become a Hyperborean initiate, a potential enemy of the White Fraternity's plans. How did such heresy occur? Who initiated him in the Hyperborean wisdom? 37. Showing the Papal Tiara, replica of Dark Atlantis priests' Egyptian crown, wearing the white gown of the Levitical priests of Israel, on which the four-leaf clover of the Golan priests is embroidered in a stylized form as a Celtic cross. In his right hand he is holding the cross, symbol of the spiritual enchainment, and in his left hand, St. Peter's keys, symbol of the Kalashakra key with which God's treacherous to the spirit of man consummated the original treason. 38. My Lord knows and respects only 
the law of honor that is the law of the Holy Spirit, of the true God's will. Nobody but your God Jehovah, who is a demon called Satan, to whom you slavishly obey, can go against that law. 39. We, the eternal warriors of Christos Lucifer, will one day put an end to the chiefs of your chiefs, to the hidden hierarchy of supreme priests who keep the uncreated spirit in the slavery of the created matter. 40. The self, expression of the spirit, appears deep inside the soul, without any possibility of heading towards the origin because it ignores its own situation. That there is a possible return towards the spirit's homeland. The self is usually lost without knowing it to be so, and is looking for the origin not knowing what it is looking for. The treacherous gods chain the self to the man-animal's soul so that the willpower resulting from the self's useless search would be used by the soul to evolve towards the final perfection. Within the anemic, anemic subject, the self is unable to take control of the microcosms unless it goes through the hyperborean initiation, which produces the effect of isolating the self from the soul by means of the uncreated Vrunas. 41. A self that is devoid of any moral and of any dogma, indifferent to the deceits of the world but open to the memory of blood, will be able to march gallantly towards the origin, and there will be no force in the universe that could stop it. 42. He who knows the secrets of the mystery of Amor is a transmuted Hyperborean initiate, namely, an immortal man of stone. 43. The mystery of Amor is experienced in seven different ways by man and precisely. That is the reason why the Hyperborean wisdom provides seven initiatory ways of liberation. The way of liberation to be taken will depend on how the mystery of Amor has been Gnostically perceived, and that is why it is usually said to be a, quote, way of the mutation, unquote, or of the lightning, a dry way, or path of the right hand, a humid way, or path of the left hand, a way of the strategic opposition, or a way of the warrior gnosis for the absolute orientation, etc. 44. To the men of stone, Hyperborean initiates of the House of Tarsus, the world where everyday life takes place is simply a battlefield, an arena occupied by mortal enemies who must be relentlessly fought because they block the returning path to the origin. They cut off the retreat, and they intend to reduce man to the most vile slavery that is the submission of the eternal spirit to the matter. Its enchainment to the evolutionary plan of the universe, created by the Demiurge and his court of demons, the world is therefore, for the men of stone, the Valplads. In Nordic mythology and in the Eddas, the Valplads is the battlefield where Wotan, chooses the ones who fall fighting for honor, for truth, on the whole, for the virtues of the spirit. 45. The grail is a gem from Christos Lucifer's crown, the one who is purer than the purest of the loyal gods, the only one who can talk face to face with the unknowable god. Christos Lucifer is the one who, being in hell, is beyond hell. Being able to stay in Hyperborea under the light of the unknowable, Christos Lucifer would rather go to the rescue of captive spirits making the incomprehensible sacrifice of his own self-captivity. He has placed himself as the black son of the spirit, charismatically illuminating from behind Venus, through the Paracletos, directly into the blood of the sleeping men. How has a gallant lord's gem been dishonored by falling here to earth, one of the most repulsive sewers of the seven hells? Because he has so provided for. Christos Lucifer has given the grail to men as guarantee of his commitment, his sacrifice, and as an irrefutable material proof of the divine origin of the spirit. The grail is accordingly a reflection of the divine origin which, as a lighthouse will guide the doubtful course of the rebel spirits that have decided to leave the slavery of Jehovah Satan. 46. The main crime committed by man has been denying the supremacy of, quote, God, unquote. That is to say, the terrestrial demiurge Jehovah Satan, and rebelling against slavery. But man is a miserable creature. 
immersed in a hell of illusion where he foolishly feels at ease, under a spell he has no possibilities of breaking by himself. If he has denied the demiurge and has rebelled, he has done so by means of an external agent, but what thing in this world is capable of awakening man, of opening his eyes to the forgotten divinity? If such thing exists, the demons will say, it is the most abominable object of the material creation. However, this, quote, thing, that, quote, abominable object, unquote, is not from this world, and the captive, captive spirit man has eaten of it, this green fruit, which will be later on called grail, is food that provides nourishment with primordial gnosis, that is, with a knowledge of the truth about the origins. Because of the grail, the forbidden fruit par excellence, man will know that he is eternal, that he has a divine spirit chained to the matter. That comes from a world impossible to imagine in the terrestrial hell, but for which he feels nostalgia and to which he longs to return. Because of the grail, man has remembered. There it is his foremost crime. Remembering the divine origin will be, from now on, a terrible sin. And those who have committed it will have to pay for it, such as the, de the Demiurge's will, the Jehovah Satan law. His ministers, the demons of Chang Shambhala, will be the ones in charge of executing the punishment by exacting retribution in a currency called pain and suffering. The instrument will be naturally incarnation repeated a thousand times in transmigrations, controlled by the law of karma, cynically declaring that pain and suffering are quote, for the good, unquote, of the spirits, to encourage their evolution. 47. The Demiurge has built the universe by imitating a clumsy and deformed image of the true worlds. He has blown his breath to the matter and has arranged it with the intention of copying that weak reflection of what he once received from the uncreated spheres. But neither the substance was the proper one, nor was the architect qualified for the task, and on top of that, it should be considered the perverse purpose of reigning as the god of the work in the likeness of the unknowable. The result is evident, a malicious and insane hell in which a long time after its creation and by a mystery of a mort, countless eternal spirits were enslaved, chained to matter and subjected to the evolution of life. Obviously, the Demiurge's main characteristic is imitation, by which he has tried to reproduce the true worlds, the result of which has been this vile and mediocre material universe but it is in the different parts of his work where the hallucinated persistence in imitating, repeating, and copying is noticed. In the universe, quote, the whole is always a copy of, quote, something, unquote. The atoms, all similar, the cells, which divide in analogous, analogous pairs, social animals, whose gregarious instinct is based on imitation, symmetry, present in countless of physical and biological phenomena, etc. Needless of further examples, it can be asserted that the overwhelming multiplicity of forms of the real is just an illusion resulting from the crossing, intersection, combination, etc. of a few initial forms. In fact, the universe has been made from dimited, different limited elements, no more than 22 that bear through infinite combinations all existing forms. 48. The way of strategic opposition uses the archimonic technique, that is to say, it places an archimona or strategic enclosure, and a lapis oppositionis outside the enclosure, in the fenestra infernalis that faces the valplets. By applying the law of enclosure to Archimana, it is possible to isolate Valplad's field, that is, to liberate an area in the world of the Demiurge. But this is not enough. It is necessary for the initiates to desynchronize themselves from worldly time 
and generate their own inverted time that may allow them to head towards the origin. To that end, they practiced the strategic opposition against the Lapis Oppositionis, which are located on a rune in the Valplads, in front of the Fenestra Infernalis. 49. It will be difficult for anyone to imagine the marvelous scene of the grail descending to the seven hells. Maybe if one thinks of the blinding brightness of a green lightning which has Gnostic influence on the one who sees, before which the demons turn away their ugly faces, frozen with horror, a lightning that, as the sharp blade of an invincible sword, goes tearing up the four hundred thousand worlds of deceit, searching for the enemy's heart, a green flying serpent that carries between its teeth the fruit of the truth. Denied and hidden until then, if one thinks in the lightning, in the sword, in the fruit, in the serpent, it may then be possible to have the intuition of what happened in that crucial time when the truth was made available to captive spirits. Yes, because since the grail settled down on the Vruna of Orichalco, the tree of science remains planted for those who, completely confused, lived in hell thinking they were living in a paradise. From now on, they could eat from its fruit and their eyes would be opened. Alleluia for Christos Lucifer, the serpent of paradise. Alleluia for those who have eaten from the forbidden fruit, the awaking and transmuted men. 50. I understood the meaning of the Teradingerber sign, and this comprehension gave me the highest level of the Hyperborean wisdom. It was the eternal spirit who was breaking free and isolating itself, as never before, from the illusion of the created forms. Yes, my own spirit, fixed and planted as a menhir that remains and emerges in the temporal flow of the soul, all of a sudden was hold to the origin. In its eternal and infinite moment, I already learnt everything. I had returned to the origin. I had broken free from the chaining of the matter, and had understood the reason of the fall. Should I have wanted to, I would have been able to leave right there towards Hyperborea. But I could not do so, not for as long as the family mission was not accomplished. For as long as all of you remained here amongst the demons, not for as long as there was still the final battle to be fought against the powers of the matter. Honor prevents me from leaving. 51. Because the spirit alone is eternal, he who does not find his spirit will die of final death even though he believes to be immortal. And the first to die will be the f souls that are closer to the end in their search for chimerical and vain archetypical perfection. Those whose souls evolve by imitating the final goal proposed by the one creator God, those who deceive themselves by identifying good with, quote, universal peace, unquote, and deprive their spirit of the opportunity to fight, those who worship the one creator God and love the material universe, those who fear Jehovah Satan and serve the powers of matter, those who continue to hold that the spirit is created and want to make it knee before the alleged creator. 52. The great white chief, the lord of absolute will and courage, will come once, twice, three times to your world. The first time, he will break history, though he will leave and provoke the senseless laugh of the demons. The second time, he will pr propose the final battle but will be gone in the midst of the demon's roar of terror. The third, he will lead the race of the spirit towards the origin, and will be gone forever, leaving behind the holocaust of fire in which the followers of the one God, men, souls, and demons, will consume. But those who follow the messenger of the Lord of War will be eternal. 53. For wise warriors... All war lost on earth as a war won in other heavens. 54. For man, transmuted in man of stone, it is always possible to fight against the demons and overcome. 55. When the final battle breaks out and the lord of the war establishes the reality of the world of the spirit, 
Those of us who have died for the Spirit's cause will be alive, ready to march out of the universe of the One, passing over the powers of matter, while behind our backs the final holocaust of the demons of the soul breaks out. 56. I beg you to find the order of wise constructors of the Lord of Absolute Orientation. They will lead you in the right direction. Besides, they will grant you the Hyperborean initiation. They will awaken you and will include you in the strategy of the final battle. 57. Their hearts were harder than the diamond stone, and they had the certainty of the eternal spirit, and experienced an essential hostility towards the powers of matter that made it possible for them to exhibit an indescri indescribable strength against any enemy. 58. If he had to destroy, he would destroy. If he had to kill, he would kill. He would do anything but negotiating with the enemy of the spirit. 59. For the first time, I felt I was myself, just self. Self, surrounded by the powers of matter. Self, besieged by God the creator of the universe. And then, as a definite consequence of having fought a battle against the soul, and having prevailed, the vision took place and I received the help I was searching for. 60. The spirit had to free itself from the enchainment of evolving matter, had to isolate itself from the law of evolution, and had to start the return to the origin. There it was that sought truth. 61. In Cordoba, a great initiate who has called himself Nimrod de Rosario had appeared. 62. He has managed to form an important support group that makes it possible for him to develop his strategy, with people coming from traditional esotericism, especially many who have understood that the Gnostic Church of Samuel Anwar is one of many synarchic sects. 63. Initiates of the Liberating Serpent Followers of the Uncreated Light Serpent Worshippers of the Avenger Serpent Here is the bearer of the Origin Sign the one who can understand the serpent with a sign, the one who can obtain the highest wisdom that the man of mud could be made known. Within this divine child, in the innermost of the eternal spirit, is the sign of the Creator's and the Creator's enemy, the symbol of the origin of our God and of all the spirits that are prisoners of the matter. 64. We know that the Demiurge received other names along history, but if we choose Jehovah's among them, it is because it has been the last name he has given himself. 65. A part of humanity we integrate has an element which is not, did not... Let me reread that sentence. A part of humanity we integrate has an element which does not belong to the material order and that cannot be determined by the Demiurge's law of evolution. This element, called spirit or vril, is present in some men as a possibility of eternity. We know about it due to the memory of blood, but as long as we are not capable of freeing ourselves from the ties that bind us to the illusionary reality of the Demiurge and go up the returning path to the origin, we will not actually exist as eternal individuals. 66. The hidden hierarchy of Chang Shambhala with its demons, the treacherous leaders and their chief, the king of the world, who are currently carrying out the, quote, evolution, end quote, of the planet, and who lead the races by means of a sinister organization called Synarchy. 67. We, the ancient Hyperborean beings who still remain chained in hell, must indeed bear in mind that the enemy is Jehovah Satan, the demiurge of this world. 68. From the miserable slavery condition of Jehovah Satan, it is not possible to know God because he is absolutely transcendent. It is necessary to go a long way of blood purification to know anything about God, about the true God. When talking about God, most of major religions refer to the demiurge the one. 
This is because the races that populate the world have been worked by the demons of Shambhala, implanting synarchic ideas in the genetic memory of their members in order to lead them to the great collective archetype called Manu. Thus, perceiving reality through a deceitful veil, one arrives to these concepts of a pantheistic, monist, or trinitarian god that are just appearances of the demiurge, the one who brought order to the matter. 69. This is not about a futile knowledge that can be reduced to a code of principles or to an operating manual by which to rule our acts. On the contrary, it is about obtaining a knowledge that can act dynamically over the spirit transforming us inside and bestowing on us a millennial wisdom that makes us transcend the merely human plane of existence. 70. Men are not all the same, not all of them exist, and neither can all men be. On the contrary, for those who have the possibility of being, the fight and the effort must focus on transcending this world of illusionary images and on perpetuating an eternity in another plane of existence to where we can only have access if we wake up from the demoniac dream in which we are immersed. Most men you see in this world do not really exist, or if you prefer, live a quote, relative existence, unquote, illusionary, which is just a blow compared to eternity. Although many believe the contrary, their consciousness is dissolved by death and nothing survives them. Eternity is only for a few men, for an aristocracy of the spirit, based on semi-divine heroes, on supermen who, after a hard-fought battle against the prince of this world, Jave Satan, transmute their inferior nature and win their place in the Valhalla. 71. For the spirit, there is no created life or death but illusion, and therefore, there is neither sin nor guilt, neither debts nor karma to be paid. 72. A true kshatriya is just he who has a heart as hard as the stone and as cold as ice, and only such a kshatriya can perform any action, even killing, without being touched by karma. 73. Once attained, Gnosis is a total, immediate knowledge the individual either entirely possesses or absolutely lacks. It is the knowledge in itself, absolute knowledge that involves man, cosmos, and divinity. And it is only through this knowledge, and not through faith or actions, that the individual may be saved. 74. Firstly, you must be what you already are. You must return to the beginning from where you have never left. You must recover the paradise you have never lost. When you solve this mystery by marching along the labyrinth path, and once you find your way out, you will be able to say, I am. But, but do not be afraid. You will not be abandoned. You will be charismatically led to the end. Follow the order of tools, closed circles, but do not stop at any one of them. You must always go on until reaching the penultimate circle. Over there, we will see each other again. 75. What can we say about a philosophy that questions all human existence with all of its dogmas, philosophies, religions, and sciences, that attempts at changing the course of history, that sustains the possibility of transmutation of the semi-divine man or viria into the immortal Siddha? that has declared war to the material powers of Yahweh, Satan, owners of the world, of history, and of most men, let's agree that such ideas would be among the most prominent in heresiology. 76. We have a copy of the letter that the supreme priest of Cheng Shambhala, Rigden Jepo, sent to Lenin through Nicholas Rorick, congratulating him for the success of the Bolshevik Revolution. Behind Lenin and October conspirators was the Tranchimalaya Lodge, founded by the White Fraternity. Yes, behind Synarchy, there is Cheng Shambhala, the masters and priests of the hidden hierarchy or White Fraternity of Cheng Shambhala. 77. 
They constitute a secret society known as Kala Circle. Its wisdom is the Kula, the left hand Tantrism, a yoga system that allows transmutation and the use of sexual energy, though it requires the physical involvement of women. The Kalikas are feared in Tibet because they are considered black magicians, but in my opinion, the only black thing they have is their robe. It is evident that such qualification comes for the, from their staunchest enemies, the members of the white fraternity, a mysterious organization behind Buddhism and other religions that is very powerful in these regions. It is by opposition and in contrast to the white fraternity that the Kalikas are called black, since they are ascetics and meet high moral standards. Every man and woman you have seen here are Sadhaka Vamacharis. The initiates in the path of Kula, both men and women, regularly perform a ritual t termed of the five challenges, by which they practice, quote, five acts forbidden to Kalashakra masters, unquote. This explains why they are hated by the gurus of Shambhala. Commonly, the secret ritual is also known as Pankamakara, or of the five Ms, because all the five names of the forbidden things start with that same letter, Madhya, wine, Mamsa, meat, Matsya, fish, Mudra, cereals, Mithuna, sexual act. According to their Buddhist enemies and due to the practice of this ritual, the Kalikas are located in the Vama Marga, or left path, the Kshatriya's path that leads to war and not to peace, to Agartha and not to Shambhala, to the absolute unification of oneself, and not to the nirvanic annihilation of the self, identified with Parabrahman, the One. Certainly, by means of the secret techniques of their sexual tantra, the Kalikas develop an incredible power over the animal nature of human body, and they even manage to obtain spiritual liberation. 78. The Kalikas follow the Kula path, which starts at the woman of flesh and ends in the original couple, deep inside oneself. At the end of that dangerous path, the Kalika, definitively confronted with the truth, and once the veils of all mysteries drawn, is Shiva, the destructor of the illusion, the warrior par excellence. For us, Shiva is Lucifer, is Cain, is Hermes, is Mercury, is Votan. 79. History summoned the fittest men to fight against evil, and we were the fittest. In a unique moment of history, we have raised the eternal banners. 80. On every point of the real space, there is a tiny globe or archetypal atom that symbolizes with precision the unity of Brahma, the Creator. At the center of each atom, there is an eye with which the One contemplates Himself from all created things. Each of the One Father's eyes is called Yod, but each pupil belongs to Mother Kuan Yin. When the blood of man is stigmatized by the lords of karma, and the pain invades the One's eyes as a pleasant symphony, Mother Kuan Yin's pupils soften the suffering cords with the mercy of her heart. That is why she is Avalokitesvara, a bodhisattva of compassion. Yes, Western Comraden, this image that astonishes you is just an opaque reflection of Kuan Yin through the veil of Maya. In this very place, in this moment, the goddess dances the dance of life, and her uncountable eyes look into your hearts, looking for the warmth of love. Kuan Yin wants to feel your hearts beating for love towards the created things. She wants to see you shudder with compassion for the pain that strikes the life of man, the pain caused by those who leave the harmony of universe and the law of the one aside. And what do Avalaka Chifara's eyes capture from your hearts? just cold and hate instead of the warmth and the love of life. Therefore, the mother's eyes soaked in tears turn away promising herself to help you so that you can return to an animal condition, to the warm heart of those who love the warm life. She is the mother of man-animal, 
of the Pasus. Her mercy will reach you and will warm your heart with her love, removing cold and hate and the hard ice. And she will do so, even though she has to spin the Kala Chakra and transform you all in primitive apes. 81. But here with you is Ganesha, Shiva's son. What has Mother Goddess of the West seen in Shiva's son heart? Also cold and hate. But building the nest for the cold death's mask, Kali's shelter, the she-black. Yes, the biggest abomination is in Shiva's son because he has hosted the death in his heart. The mask of death that conceals the naked truth of infinite blackness of oneself. In Ganesha's heart, over the dead body of the Pasu, Mother Kuan Yin's son Kali the Black dances the dance of the cold death, and in the dead body of the Pasu, that is Carrion, still lives Shiva's phallus, the diamond lingam of Vajra, before the symbol of absolute virility. Kali draws the veil and lets Parvati Freya, the truth, behind the Black Death manifest. Parvati Freya performs then the Yoni Mudra over the lingam of Shiva, and Bharava comes back to life in the heart of Shiva's son. A child of Vajra has been ab abnormally born in the heart of Ganesha, a child engendered by the spirit of Shiva with the truth behind the mask of death, a child conceived in the womb of the infinite blackness of oneself, a child born in the broken vulva of the dead heart of the Pasu, a child of Vajra, a child of diamond, a child of stone, a child of lightning, a child of cold fire, a child god, a child who is the uncreated Vruna and who is beyond Kula and Akula, beyond time and space, beyond life and death, beyond good and evil, definitively beyond the Pasu, killed by Kali in the heart of Shiva's son. The millions' eyes of Avalokchefara have seen great evil in the heart of Shiva's son, an evil for which neither her merciful tears, nor her compassion, nor her love are enough. It is an evil for which there is no redemption possible, not in this life, or any other life, in the Serapi Korlo wheel of life. It is the evil of he who runs away from his father and his mother's cares, he who rejects his father and mother, who finds out he has no father or mother, who finds the naked truth of oneself and insists on being what he is and not what he is supposed to be according to the law. Oh, how ungrateful the one who thus chills his heart towards his mother and holds hate towards his father. The naked truth has rooted in the man's heart over a bed of ice, and he has become a virya, a god that competes with the one god. However, the naked truth has chilled the virya's heart because it is the enemy of love, and Mother Kuan Yin cannot allow that. The naked truth, the enemy of love, has caused too much harm. With Kali's mask, she has murdered the Pasu, her firstborn, and with the power of the naked truth, she has given birth to an abominable being that was born over the dead body of the Pasu, a child of diamond stone, a child who is not and will never be human. Such is the harm caused by the enemy, terrible the evil that nests in the heart of Shiva's son. 82. What has Mother Goddess of the West seen in the heart of Shiva's son? A wolf, a murderer of lambs, a child of stone son of himself and husband of the naked truth, an abominable, doughty existence outside creation. But above all, Kuan Yin has seen the one who can manifest the naked truth to the world, show the forbidden and intoxicating beauty of the enemy of men and spread the evil of wisdom as an epidemic. To Mother Kuan Yin's eyes, Shiva's son is the demon of man's destruction. The naked truth that Ganesha can exhibit to sleeping men will provoke in them a new and atrocious fall into the nothingness of the uncreated. Over the ruins of the humanity of love, Ganesha, transformed into Shiva, will dance the dissolution of the created, the decomposition of Maya, the final death of illusion. And in the pralaya of Kuan Yin's love and mercy, over the death of humanity, and the goddard Damarung of, of the fraternity, the resurrected heroes, the semi-divine Viryas, the men-gods, will praise the naked truth of oneself, the enemy of love, wife of the origin. 
Oh, how Avalokitshvara's millions' eyes cry when they understand the evil that inhabits in the heart of Shiva's son. 83. For us as well as for Krishna, Indra's son, killing means nothing if the murderer's spirit is beyond maya, the illusion of life. When our scimitar cuts off the miserable life, the spirit performs the dance of destruction along with Shiva. 84. They had a spiritual goal to attain, and they were in a diabolical world, in such Gnostic circumstances. The solution is always the same. The spiritual goal justifies any means used to make one's way in a hostile territory. 85. If all existing beings, and all the other created beings, though related with each other in space and time, are not strategically meaningful, they do not exist for the spirit, they are maya, illusion. As an initiate, you should know better. Have you by any chance forgotten that this is a war between the spirit and the powers of the matter? 86. In the Neurologic Ethic of the Hyperborean Wisdom, we have demonstrated to you the spiritual superiority of the self above the heart. We have taught you to control the heart with the self. We deprived you from feelings and we forged a new heart of steel. 87. As the Hyperborean Wisdom assures, the created soul is about to betray us because its substance is part of the Creator is part of its archetype in his image and likeness. There I most certainly proved it. The soul would always betray the spirit, the self, to favor the will of the demons that belong to the white hierarchy in which the one creator unfolds and chains himself to. 88. The creator God is nourished by a strength that is called human pain and man generates pain and suffering to nourish the creator of the great deceit. 89. I verified the power, the terrible power that a Hyperborean initiate, a man-god, is able to show. End of that part of the fragments. Beginning of part two. Fragments from Fundamentals of the Hyperborean Wisdom. 90. By dominating the Hyperborean wisdom, the Hyperborean initiates reach the highest level of esoteric knowledge, the science of the runes, and attain terrible powers. 91. As a consequence of treacherous, treacherous Siddha's betrayal, three kinds of men appear on earth. The primitive hominid called since then man-animal or pasu, the Pasu with a, quote, Hyperborean lineage, unquote, called Virya, that is, the Pasu in whom there is a possibility for the captive spirit to manifest itself, and the Hyperborean Siddha, who can be both the spirit liberated from captivity and one of the ancient guides who remains on earth in a place called Agartha to fight the enemy and accomplish the final rescue of the captive spirits. Today's man is, to some extent, a lost Virya. This means that a double nature, divine and human, exists in him, as rightly stated by Gnostics in the first centuries of the present era. 92. The spirit is eternal. It is as potent or even more than the Demiurge himself. It remains chained because it is not aware of being so. 93. When going through the origin into the universe of the One, the spirit does so as an enemy. That is why it takes the form of a spirit sphere, thus showing its essential hostility. 94. The spirit sphere appears in the material universe closed in itself, turned around the absolute self and showing the demiurge a hostile back everywhere. But the turgum, the back, opposes the Demiurge, not as an opponent, but as an adversary, because, it must be said, the spirit sphere is a god more potent than the Demiurge. 95. 
The material world is pure appearance, pure illusion, pure phenomenon, pure evolutionary process, pure contingency and accident. For the spirit, the world does not exist, it is not. But the demiurge certainly is, and against him, a combat will be fought for the return towards the origin, for the recovery of the primordial state that we allegorically represent here in the spherical form. 96. Jehovah is the Kabbalistic name of the Demiurge the One that Sanat Kamara represents on earth, and is the last historical name we know of him. That is why we, the ancient Hyperborean beings who still remain chained to this demon demoniac world, must very well bear in mind that the enemy is Jehovah Satan, the Demiurge of this world. 97. All the universe has been built from a first monad tirelessly imitated by the Demiurge. That is why the Demiurge's essential characteristic is imitation. 98. The highest metaphysics is the Hyperborean Gnosis. 99. What is the only way out for Varios? What hopes of escaping from the insane plans of the Demiurge and the treacherous Siddhas can he cherish? Answer. The liberation of the Hyperborean spirit. In other words, the only chance of escaping is for Varius to go through this Hyperborean memory back to the origin and transmute into a divine Hyperborean, unchaining the captive spirit. 100. Though most lost Varius ignore it, the golden chain gives the marvelous possibility of acquiring, by means of the pure blood, the highest level any other Varia has ever reached in any other part of the world. Certainly, such possibilities shall only be available for those who are in the strategic space of a mystic. 101. The Hyperborean vision leads us to the liberation from the causal order, to the elevation of man from the collective where he is immersed, and to his definitive individuation, so reintegrating himself to the awake self and the selst. It is the end of the Kali Yuga, or Dark Age. The synarchic vision implies to continue in the causal order, subjected to the law of evolution and to the rules of material progress on which Western civilization is based. It implies a growing immersion of the individual in the collective, the history marching towards a future mechanically complex society, in which man will disappear as such in a metaphysical atrophy of his self. The essential goal to be fulfilled by the synarchic vision, the world government. 102. The Hyperborean wisdom, through seven secret ways, provokes a strategic reorientation in the lost Viria, making it possible for him to start, quote, or restart, unquote, the return to the origin, and to abandon the infernal world of the matter. The lost Viria, as we have already mentioned, is in a despicable state of material enchainment that makes him cling to the laws of karma, to periodically reincarnate and live or relive an eternal and miserable comedy marked by the ominous illusion of pain, fear, and death. In the great deceit of life, the lost Viria may occupy any place, and he can even collaborate with the evolutionary, progressive plan of Jehovah Satan, or with his social control system, called shortly Synarchy. 103. The normal way of existence of the captive spirit is so essentially opposed to the Demiurge's material universe that its only external characteristic is hostility. 104. For the one who has heard the voice of the pure blood and decides to fight, the act of individual war cannot be otherwise characterized but by the Gnostic hate towards the world of the Demiurge. The awake Varia will be constantly trying to experiment the essential hostility with the intention of strategically reorienting the reverted spirit. In that essential hostility that the Hyperborean spirit once unfolded against the material universe of the One will characterize, to a minimum extent, the act of war that the awake Varia will perform against evil, that is, against the macrocosmos of the Demiurge Jehovah Satan. 
it should be noticed that the hostility towards the matter is the main ingredient of the Gnostic attitude, the characteristic that clearly reveals the presence of the Spirit. The contrary is likewise true. Without hostility, there is no Gnosis. 105. The active individual war, performed with the essential hostility in its kairos, supposes an incredible challenge, a luciferic rebellion, the echoes of which are heard in every place or plane of the macrocosmos and every heaven, in the gloomiest meanders of the universal soul, and such a challenge that it has been Gnostically declared with profound knowledge, irrevocable, cannot be ignored by the demiurge, cannot be overlooked by the great deceiver. That is why the enemy reaction is not long in coming, and soon the awake Virya must face the terrible secret of Maya. The Demiurge's second intention, which is focused on achieving his destruction. 106. In fact, the spirit sphere can already be unchained, reversed, returned to normality. But there are two ways for such a reversion to take place. And that is why the awake Varya must decide. One way is to invert the original process of treason. This is achieved by the awake self, by voluntarily introducing itself through the eye of fire and by becoming an absolute self within the normal sphere. In such case, the spirit sphere, now normal, may abandon the infernal universe of the demiurge and may return to the world of the unknowable. But there is also another possibility. That reversion of the spirit takes place over the awake various microcosmos, transmuting his substance into Vajra and transforming the Varya into an immortal Siddha. 107. The alleged god, supposedly the creator of the spirit, of the being known for the Gnostic predisposition of the Chosen One, shows total indifference towards his creature. The Chosen One may address the Creator God in many different ways without ever receiving an answer to his questions, as regards what is known by Gnostic predisposition. Not even the most submissive devotion nor the most demanding claims would obtain nothing but silence from the One. Most certainly, such situation occurs because the Chosen One has addressed the wrong God, not the Creator of the Spirit, but the Creator of the Soul in which His Eternal Spirit is chained and the one can only be indifferent in face of a spirit that is a foreigner in his creation. 108. Consequently, the enemy's strategy intends both to definitively confuse him by means of the mentioned esoteric science, which has nothing to do with the Hyperborean spirit, and to destroy his self, expression of the uncreated spirit by means of a synarchic yoga practice. 109. There is a whole extraterrestrial race and an original couple waiting for the awakening and the liberation of the Chosen One. And there is an external world, an original Hyperborea, outside the material universe, an unimaginable world for the non-initiate, which is the home of the Hyperborean spirit, and to which the whole race longs for returning. The war against the powers of the matter, it must not be forgotten, is fought to liberate the captive spirits. The war is won every time a spirit is freed from enchainment. It is therefore an ethnologic duty of the Chosen One to wake up and liberate his spirit. 110. Gnosis does not come just from inheritance, nor from spontaneous illumination, but from the willing of awakening and of being what the spirit is, that is to say, Gnosis comes from the struggle between the eternal spirit manifested in the Virya as a lost self and the soul, that extension of the Demiurge. 111. The Demiurge's consciousness feeds on human pain, and most appalling of all is that human pain is necessary, absolutely necessary, for the Demiurge's own evolution. The macrocosmic goal of the Pasu's purpose, to build outer cultures, to give sense to entities, helps the evolutionary development of the Demiurge's consciousness. Such consciousness of the Demiurge grows according to the sense of the world, 
by the significant emergence of cultural events. In the same way as the Passu's sphere of consciousness grows as a result of the emergence of conscious representations. Those who understand this need of pain that exists in the essence of the Demiurge's world will verify that it is utopian to expect the pain to disappear someday from human life. On the contrary, the pain and suffering will constantly increase parallel to cultural progress, and the Demiurge by himself will never do anything to reverse the present state of the lost Virya. 112. The Hyperborean Wisdom asserts that the main source of human pain, which is poverty, will never be eradicated from cultural communities through any synarchic system of government. On the contrary, communists, democrats, liberals, social democrats, socialists, republicans, christian democrats, etc., will do their best to increase poverty, though concealing, naturally, their true intentions. 113. Usually, the Virya does not find the spirit because, instead of looking for a god, what his Hyperborean spirit is, devotes himself to pursue a caricature on crutches, a vile illusion of a tiny, sweet, and asexual spirit that effusively chants sacred psalms to Jehovah's throne. This repulsive spiritual creature is the one that some lost Virya's and other silly persons believe to be or would like to be some day, after death, or on the last judgment day, etc., Virias should be persuaded, then, that the Hyperborean spirit belongs to a race of warriors and that hostility towards the material world is the main quality of its essence. 114. The aspiration to perfection that characterized the psychological ethics of the Pasu essentially opposes to the inspiration for liberation that describes the neurological ethics of the awake Virya. 115. The spiritual enchainment is a hostile act of war, and nobody can unchain his spirit without fighting. The warrior attitude is essential for the way of the strategic opposition that we propose in this book, or for any other Hyperborean way. Hence, the collision with the Demiurge is sooner or later inevitable. 116. In this inevitable clash, in which the Hyperborean warrior and the Demiurge will fight face to face, the most difficult test for the warrior to overcome will be contemplating the Demiurge's terrible face. 117. The major test set up by the Hyperborean wisdom in order to obtain initiation, that is, the test of courage, consists exclusively in the contemplation of the one's terrible face. But this face may be the dragon of the world or a different image just as dreadful if not more so, another insane aspect of the Demiurge. In sum, here we want to warn that whenever one of the seven plus one secret ways to liberation proposed by the Hyperborean wisdom is followed, the time will come when a collision with the Demiurge will occur, and the contemplation of his terrible face may be dangerous and requires extreme courage. 118. It is not the word but the eye of the Demiurge, an eye endlessly multiplied in all creation, but it is always the same eye. Here is the Maya, an eye that contemplates itself, that admires itself perpetually, an eye that is in the wolf that lurks and in the lamb that runs away, in the man that stabs his brother with a dagger and his dying brother. Also. In the dagger intoxicated with the gurgling blood, an eye that looks from the loved one and from the one who loves, and from the treason of the third one. Finally, that eye, the socket of which is a pinnacle that descends to the abysms of good and evil, is Abraxas's eye, a terrible and insane eye. Indeed, Alexandrian Gnostics, who knew the kind of monster they have to deal with, shut the Abraxas eye in a triangle, that is, they implement the law of enclosure in order not to become schizophrenic. 119. Yoga initiation, as well as Masonic, Theosophic, Rosicrucian, and other rituals are referred to with the generic term of synarchic initiation, in contrast with Hyperborean initiation. The synarchic initiation chains the initiate to the white hierarchy while the Hyperborean initiation isolates the self of the initiate 
from all kind of hierarchical logos, opening the way towards the eternal spirit absolute freedom. 120. The synarchy and its masters of wisdom or gurus keep such esoteric knowledge just for those who have proved to deserve the synarchic initiation, that is, those who are willing to unreservedly adore the One, the Demiurge, Brahma, Jehovah, Satan, Jesus, etc., or any other aspect or appearance of the Great Deceiver. 121. The cast of warriors knew the mystery of Amor, the secret of the original fall of the Hyperborean spirit. Such secret allowed the practice of a kind of nuptial initiation, during which the recreative power of the Kundalini Logos was used for the benefit of a liberating secret way of the Hyperborean wisdom. This was the Western Yoga, from which, after a terrible cultural degradation, resulted the Tantra Yoga. 122. In addition to a million years long desired reencounter with the spirit, the Hyperborean woman will be the one who, during sexual intercourse, or Mythuna, will project Lilith's shape, the female warrior partner of the Hyperborean spirit, over the Akasa globe of the Sadaka. Lilith projection will blow the globe up and will give form to the Kundalini Logos. She will blow it up because she will dance the runas of death over the Akasa globe, and she will give form to Kundalini Logos because she will surround it when it manifests itself outside the globe. This exterior action of the Hyperborean woman has the mission of incorporating the image of the female Hyperborean spirit inside the Virya, an image forgotten during millions of years of confusion, and that is an integral part of the mystery of the fall. That when Lilith revives inside the magical wedding, the ceremony of the spiritual reorientation and the organic transmutation performed on the nuptial bed of the pure blood is consummated. However, the Sadhaka will not result from that transmutation in a Manu, but in a Hyperborean warrior, in an immortal Siddha. 123. All the immortals of the hierarchy shall certainly die when the macrocosmical cycle is over, namely, when the Pralaya comes. 124. Consequently, the Synarchic Initiate will be immortal quote, immortal, as long as the macrocosmos lasts, that is, during the manvantara, or manifestation of the One. 125. For Tantra Yoga, as for any other Hyperborean way to liberation, the declared goal is the return to the origin, the unchainment of the spirit, its strategic reorientation, its reversion in the absolute freedom of eternity. 126. Tantra is another of the secret ways to liberation, and therefore, it pursues the same declared goal, to awake the Virya and lead him to the origin, to the conquest of the Vril. How does Tantra intend to accomplish such goal? Transmuting the physical body of Sadaka and making it immortal during the practice of Mithuna, the sexual intercourse. So liberating him from the karmic chains and allowing the manifestation of the Hyperborean spirit consciousness in him. Once in such a state, with his body made of Vajra and his Gnostic consciousness now awake, he is already a Siddha, a being capable of implementing the pure possibility offered by the Vril and abandon if he prefers the material universe. 127. The force of Kundalini will allow expanding consciousness to other subtle bodies of men and reach Sahasrara, or Lodo of the Thousand Petals, where the fusion with the Brahma Demiurge is achieved by means of a, quote, jump of consciousness, unquote, toward the absolute immanence. With the consciousness in the Sahasrara, an ecstasy is obtained that consists, paradoxically, of the dissolution of individual consciousness after its fusion or identification with Quote, cosmic consciousness, unquote. that is to say, with the demiurge. For the Hyperborean Tantra, this exoteric goal, trance state or samadhi, and the fusion with the one or nirvana and the sahasrara is simply a suicide. The esoteric goal of Tantra, we have already mentioned, is the same as for any Hyperborean strategy, the mutation of the Pasu's animal nature into Siddha's divine and immortal nature. 
Therefore, it must be clear that the Hyperborean Virya, by means of Tantra, does not look for any fusion with the Demiurge, but, on the contrary, he wants to completely isolate himself from the Demiurge to obtain the absolute individuality given by the Vril. 128. Kundalini should not be awakened if one does not possess the keys to take advantage of its recreator power, because Kundalini's word may represent the one's will in the microcosmos that assures evolution, as well as the Hyperborean Virya's own will in order to make mutation happen. 129. The animal's flesh stands for the major mystery of all, after the mystery of love. However, the Hyperborean wisdom advises the Virya not to go deeper into that mystery until the liberation obtained by transmuting into Siddha has been achieved, so as not to add more horror to the horror of being chained to matter. 130. Nowhere else, outside human sphere, will the dramatic character of life be best confirmed than in the animal kingdom. In its unsurpassable stupidity, in the determination of its instincts, in the horror of their fights for survival that makes them to devour each other, in the fatality of their death, etc. With no doubt, it is in the animal where the infamy of the demiurge is best described. Man, in order to bear the vision of fright that life in this world is, created a cultural veil called poetry that, for example, wherever he sees a miserable life that constantly eats and defecates, there he makes a gorgeous singing bird come into view. Poetry disguises the horror of life, and that is why it is the major enemy of Gnosis. 131. The path of the Gnostic man consists of avoiding devotion and jumping towards the principles, making a transcendent contact with the unity within which all multiple dualities are solved. But such contact does not occur through the fusion with the One, neither through any kind of identification with the Demiurge, but through understanding the inner uni unity of the microcosmos in which macrocosmos reflects. This understanding is a pure knowledge, a gnosis that makes the Virya, after an infinite horror, overcome the manifestation and rebuild the Demiurge's unity, so that, in a mad vision, he confirms his intrinsic insanity and evilness. However, after the horror, there comes the discovery of the true God, the one who cannot be known from the abysm. All Gnosis ends there, in the certainty of the unknowable. 132. The Gnostic man does not aim at annihilating his self and does not renounce action. On the contrary, he strengthens his self by strategically orienting his will to act. That is why, in the Gnostic man, it is the self who awakens Kundalini, determining its form. 133. And here comes the terrible demand, the fundamental key to the mystery of love, without which no tantric practice has hyperborean sense. The outside woman, the yogini, cannot be any woman. She must be a Kali woman. 134. To give Lilith a face is a supreme experience that means to contemplate the divine face of the Hyperborean woman again after millions of years of infamy. End of the Gnostic Fragments of Nimrod de Rosario